Viewer discretion is advised. Chapter 2 Reborn Sometime Earlier As one would peer into this next mesmerizing chapter of this cold and dreary story, they would be remiss to go without noticing one particular detail. And this detail would be a figure. A figure of a man. A man walking briskly through the hallway that laid before him. He was carrying a file with him as he kept up his pace. He was a thin white gentleman and wore what seemed to be some type of black jumpsuit. There was a small logo upon his chest with the symbol of a red atom representing the organization the man belonged to. Just below the symbol read the organization's name and that name was Dark Scope. And underneath that, read the gentleman's name, First Lieutenant McCree, and to the side of this logo sat several medals that the man had achieved throughout his tenure with this militarized firm he seemed to be employed by. As McCree moved quickly down the brightly lit hallways, he passed by several large open windows. They presented a series of dark voids that apparently belonged to the darkest of any night sky just outside. As he walked, he firmly gripped a small stack of papers while his reflection upon the glossy gray flooring below mimicked his every move. Through several twists and turns, he kept up his pace as he passed by others, some by themselves and some in groups, everyone appearing to be in the same style of jumpsuit he wore, a pattern amounting to a well-manned and uniformed complex. He kept his head straight and spoke to no one even to the point of flat-out ignoring several officers saluting him, obviously paying their respects to the higher-ranking officer. Eventually, he made his way around a corner, and there before him were two large sliding steel doors, almost like doors you would see in a submarine or space shuttle. Posted in front of the doors stood an armed guard who quickly noticed McCree, and in response of the appearance of this military officer, he immediately pressed a button on the security desk he stood next to. Just then, cued by the button the armed guard had just pressed, the two doors slid open. McCree, not slowing, walked through the doors and found himself walking through another hallway. As he picked up his pace, he paid no attention whatsoever to the breathtaking scenery he now found himself immersed in. 
It was a long corridor made entirely of glass, momentarily placing the man in what one could only define to be a human-sized transparent tube. The floor, however, was the same glossy gray flooring he had been traversing throughout all the other hallways he had now left behind. Of course, a glassy tube and a well-polished floor is not exactly breathtaking. Outside of the glass, however, was a whole different story, as many would be overwhelmed to find themselves miles above the Earth in low orbit, nothing but the thin glassy pane surrounding oneself from the icy cold vacuum of space. He continued to walk as he came up to another set of steel doors that seemed to automatically open for him. As they did so, at the end of the room, one could see a man sitting behind a large, white, curved desk that seemed to simply rise from the floor with an elegant twist, as no table legs were visible. The entire room was about as large as a university auditorium. To the sides were steel walls with doors that seemed to lead to smaller and more private rooms. The gentleman at the desk raised his head and focused on the man walking toward him, seemingly with a sense of urgency. And the nameplate on the desk, this man sat behind, read Kostya Lenkov. And behind Mr. Lenkov, there was a large window that held a picturesque view of planet Earth, as if it were framing the blue rock within its massive panes of glass. McCree quickly approached Lenkov, who was a slightly heavy-set man. He wore a suit and tie, not appearing to be of the military himself, and kept a gray beard and mustache, which seemed to complement the older man's silver hair. On his sports coat was a small pendant of the Russian flag. And now, as McCree stood in front of Lenkov's desk, he placed the papers from within his file before him as a dialogue in Russian began to take place. The coordinates, sir. He is standing by, McCree stated, cueing Lenkov to direct his attention to the officer now in front of him. He looked at McCree with a serious expression and then back down to the papers. He picked up a phone and waited a few seconds as McCree nervously stood by. Suddenly, Lenkov began to speak into the phone. Yes, good. Put him through. Lenkov turned to the panes of glass that peered into the dark ether behind his desk. Suddenly, a hologram came up in the middle of this oversized window. A man too close to the camera on the other end sat back and slowly came into focus. Once again, it was Thomas Shields, and he was now sitting inside a dark vehicle. He seemed slightly busy, as if he were multitasking and not giving his undivided attention to the video chat. This, however, had no bearing on the matter as Lenkov, with a booming voice, stood up and yelled at the hologram of the double agent now appearing across his screen. Explain, American comrade, quickly. Thomas focused his attention at the screen, as the signal seemed to slightly go in and out as staticky lines crisscrossed throughout the glass between them. It's the Chancellor. I fucking told you, he was a bad idea. We should have left him in that fucking sewer. Lenkov interrupted Thomas as he grew more serious. Always excuses with you Americans. You have contract with me, Mr. Shields. Do not forget. You would not be wanting Mr. Brooks to find out about our little arrangement. He does not fare well with middlemen. Thomas looked away from the monitor and wiped his brow. He then leaned into the monitor and responded to Lenkov. What the fuck do you want me to do? Unless we receive reinforcements like tomorrow, the Chancellor outnumbers you. He's gone rogue Lenkov and he's taking your entire operation with him. Lenkov, seeming to gain a desire to strangle the agent through the screen, spoke once more. I understand there has been a breakdown somewhere in my chain of command. I assure you, I am handling this within my highest ranks. Mr. Brooks has been ordered to report to me in next couple of weeks. Matter should be resolved soon. Then, my Russian comrades will be back in control of South America. But for now, Mr. Shields, this is not the issue. 
You oversee this cartel faction. They have contract with us, remember? I will give you one week, Mr. Shields. Get the Mexicans in order. If we lose South America, it will be the beginning to your ends, Agent. Thomas hesitated and reluctantly responded to the Russian. Yes, sir. Lenkov eased his voice as a show of reward for the double agent's reluctantly good behavior. Good. We have an understanding. Also, due to this shortage of men, I have sent word to Chavez requesting his assistance. And he has accepted. Please show him around. Bring him up to speed on the situation. Mr. Shields looked at the screen with seriousness mixed with confusion, unable to resist uttering the question quickly surfacing from within his mind. Chavez? The Sinaloa? But sir, Mr. Cruz is restricted to the north, he stated, seeking to confirm that Lenkov had been referring to Chavez Cruz, as in the leader of the international cartel, the Sinaloa. Lenkov replied, while Thomas looked slightly startled. Da, you should hear from him in the next couple of days. Now, about this, Mr. Meeks. That was when Thomas rolled his eyes and took his cue. It's taken care of. I just spoke with one of our moles within the last state, Private Andrews. Meeks is currently headed south. He'll be intercepted and diverted to Darius shortly after that. Linkov looked to the screen and spoke more carefully airing a sense of importance with his next few words. Do not underestimate this, Mr. Meeks. My men have briefed me on this rebel. Make sure he is dead. Now is not the time to be playing with our food. This stray cattle must be euthanized. Our clients are very concerned about this particular seven. Destroy him. Thomas peered behind him at an officer, sitting near the back of his dark vehicle before looking back to Lenkov as he smiled with a reply. Sir, don't worry about that. Knowing that this is where his conflicting alliances seem to line up for once, he spoke his next words with confidence. He will be dealt with, sir. A few days later, it is here that we come back to a place in time, a time of innocence. A time of naiveness. Most importantly, a time of pause. But just like the universe we live in, a pause can only last for so long. We come to a land known to many lost sheep, a place called Darius. The skies above, bleak and lacking any stars, held a somber calm. Though empty of warmth and full of questions, its heavens seemingly safeguarded the vast community below. It is in this community, a community that one might call sanctuary, or another might call open pasture, C-61, that a familiar event begins to unfold. An event between two men, and this event is now unfolding, just outside a small home within its familiar backyard, shrouded in the same twilight many here have come to know. As these two men come into focus, it was clearly Trevor and the outsider that had warned him previously regarding Trevor's new home, this so-called sanctuary. They were in conversation, a conversation that took place once before, and a conversation that came to a sudden end when suddenly the outsider simply disappeared. But now, instead of stopping here, this time, without the man disappearing, Somehow, the conversation continued. This is the new open pasture, completely isolated, where they have full control. And when I say they, I don't mean these American soldiers. It's someone else who really sits at the top between all the different militarized forces and this client they all are vying for. A man named Arlo Brooks. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a man that Trevor did not see close in on him, subdued Trevor with a hand around his waist and another muffling his mouth. As Trevor's instincts began to kick in, he started to fight back, only quickly giving up as the man in front of him, this outsider, 
that had been speaking to him slowly raised a gun to Trevor's head. Then, the outsider, once again, spoke up. We don't have time to explain. I promise you, Trevor, you will be okay. The kids will be fine. But for now, you must be quiet. He is coming. Trevor gave the outsider a look of confusion. But instead of quailing the curious Mr. Meeks, his two captors quickly ushered him away as they each found cover behind some dense shrub. From there, Trevor could still see his backyard. And now, completely unaware of what these men were up to, Trevor, while worried about Caleb and Delilah still in their home, watched what happened next with pure amazement. He flinched and made a slight sound of pain with his mouth, still muffled by one of the men's hands, realizing that he had just been poked with a needle. The man who poked him then took the same needle and injected its recently acquired payload into a small glossy cube that seemed to be made of a greenish-like gel and was about the size of a die. Trevor watched his blood, now being placed into this mysterious cube, mix with the curious object right before his eyes as it soon began to bubble. The man then threw the cube back to where Trevor was once standing. Suddenly, almost making Trevor dizzy in utter and sheer disbelief, he saw the cube before him begin to steam. Once it had boiled down into a small puddle, defying all physics, the puddle began to expand. The thick liquid puddle kept growing, bigger and bigger. It soon began to thicken while Trevor's gaze slightly shifted up. He watched the liquid begin to somehow rise from the ground as if it were standing up. Standing up, almost like a human would. He continued to watch in utter disbelief as the puddle quickly took the shape of an erect human figure. And as the figure became defined, the glossiness of the entity dissolved into toned and dry skin as all the wetness seemed to magically drip upward into the air. Finally, the end product appeared within seconds in the center of the patio as a duplicate of Trevor Meeks stood before the three who were still hiding amongst the thick shrubs. Trevor, given no real choice as he was being held down by two large men, watched on as the clone looked back at the porch where Trevor and the outsider had once been talking as if he expected to see someone. But no one was there. The two large men kept Trevor subdued, preventing him from alerting the clone to their hidden position. The clone, now, not seeing anyone and looking perplexed, as if it were expecting to see the outsider itself, having, after all, just been in conversation with him, was then startled by a sound. Trevor could see himself, and Trevor was beside himself, or in front of himself. It all became overwhelming as he watched this body double of his, born from nothing but a small cube, try to reason with itself. Should it investigate further? Should it seek out the outsider it once was speaking with? Or should it answer the door? The three watched as Trevor looked to the man kneeling next to him. The man looked back at him and gestured for Trevor to continue watching. Trevor wondered what his duplicate would do. Would it find them? Or would it simply forget about the outsider and proceed to answer the door? And then, the clone, believing itself to be Trevor, thought of the children. And with that, it quickly made its decision. It then stepped into the house as Trevor watched it move with eerily familiar motions. He watched as the clone closed the door behind it, as it continued across the house, seemingly moving with an objective. They now observed the situation occurring within, by what little they could see, through a small, open back window. The three watched as the clone stood at the front door, hesitating before opening it. Then, as expected, it reached forward and opened the door. Trevor watched in complete shock, as the man at the door came into view, it was a sight he had missed for years now. It was Thomas, Seth's father. He was standing at the door, completely unharmed.
Trevor began to protest as he tried to explain who he thought he was seeing. One of the men put a knife up to Trevor's throat and a finger to his lips, gesturing Trevor to be quiet or else. Unsure of exactly what was happening, Trevor quieted down and once again joined his two captors in viewing the ongoings from within the small home. Suddenly, causing Trevor's blood to run cold, he saw two men, dressed in fatigues, come from either side of Thomas. As they approached the clone with assault in mind, one of them knocked Trevor's duplicate out cold with the butt of a rifle. Trevor maintained wide eyes as panic began setting in, while he then watched them stuff his clone's body inside a black body bag. The next thing Trevor saw made him begin to panic even more, as Thomas, after watching his men carry the clone's body outside, turned and went down the hallway, possibly seeking Caleb and Delilah. They most likely ran, seeing the latest turn of events unfold before their little eyes. His captors once more put him in his place. Stay. Fucking. Calm. The kids will be fine. Trust me, they won't hurt the kids. Trevor, finding it hard to believe his captors, found himself with no options as he helplessly watched Thomas escort two small children outside of the home. Trevor could only picture his sister Beck as he felt that he had finally and ultimately let his late older sibling down. Just then, the black gentleman who had first approached Trevor looked over at him and began speaking. I know you have a lot of questions, and you will get answers. But for now, I am truly sorry. Trevor looked up at the man and rolled his eyes, expressing his weariness of being manhandled. He then posed his question the best he could muffled through the hand that was still over his mouth, causing his inquiry to come across slightly comical. Sorry for what? The man looked at him as he pulled a device up to Trevor's neck and squeezed a trigger. Trevor felt a large needle pierce his skin right above his collarbone as his aggressor dutifully answered him. For that, Trevor watched the two men in their surroundings fade into a black void as he quickly became unconscious. As darkness seemed to be the only detail he could make out, Trevor tried to move, but was soon to find out he was completely strapped down to a hard surface. Suddenly the lights came on and temporarily blinded him. Bright colors and nonsensical shapes shifted from one place to another as Trevor began to regain his focus. Everything spun as he heard voices and laughter come and go while flickers of light flashed here and there. Slowly gaining focus, and finally somewhat in control of his faculties, he found himself in what looked like an operating room with an enclosed observation deck above him. Looking directly at it, he could see that it appeared empty. With his best attempts, Trevor began to thrash around, feeling his straps for weaknesses. As he looked at his wrists, he noticed his restraints. Each arm was strapped to the side rails of the bed with a strong adhesive blue tape, and his feet found themselves in a similar situation. He continued to protest his position as he thrashed even harder. After no luck, he then began to yell, You know, this shit is getting really fucking old. If we want to change as a society, we should really stop tying each other up. You know, maybe, talk to each other, open a dialogue, fuck. This outburst finally gained the attention of someone above, as a tall, slender gentleman with a shaven scalp came into view on the other side of the glass. Seemingly unmoved by Trevor's previous wisecrack, the mysterious man leaned over and pressed a button on a control panel. His voice immediately occupied the entirety of the large room. Trevor listened seeming to only make out most of the man's silhouette. Mr. Meeks, you must calm down. We must know we can trust you before we can attempt to work alongside you. Once we can trust you, Mr. Meeks, we can release you. This cued Trevor to increase his sarcasm 
as he was sick of being in the dark on things. Great. Yeah. This is awesome. Really, really great. Hey, I'm suddenly getting good feelings about you dickheads. You know, you're right. This whole tying people down shit really works. You guys are awesome. Trevor looked at the man, assuming he was making his best eye contact, but unable to see the man clearly through the glass window above. Then he slowly repeated himself in an exaggerated tone. Just fucking awesome. Then, without breaking eye contact, the man spoke over the speaker once more, quickly causing Trevor's demeanor to become quite more serious. Also, the voice stated, you may want to consider the little ones. After all, you do wish to see them again, yes. Trevor gave his best menacing glare to the stranger above his head as he listened while the voice proceeded over the loudspeaker. That's better, Mr. Meeks. Don't worry. Relax. You are in good hands now. Kit will be with you shortly. Trevor, having heard this name before, slipped through Delilah's lips back on Earth, allowed an expression of disbelief mixed with confusion wash over his face. The man then looked at Trevor and addressed him one final time. Ah, you have heard of this kit before. Yes, you know. Delilah is a smart young girl. Mr. Meeks, quite intuitive, that one. The stranger then came close to the glass where Trevor could make out more detail of this man speaking to him from above. And with that, he watched as the man simply gave Trevor a wink and a smile, and then simply disappeared.